When I woke up in London on the 9th of November, the morning after Donald Trump was voted into power, I called my mother. I called my aunties and my cousins and my grandmother, all of whom are in the US. Then I called my sister. I called my best friends. I called the women I love. I called the people who make me feel safe. I called the people I organize with. All of the people I called that morning have three things in common. I would trust them with my life. That's the first thing. The second thing is this, they are all racialized as black. And the third thing is that when we spoke, it became clear very quickly that they were not unsurprised by Trump's rise to power. Were we angry? Upset? Yes. Were we scared? For good reason. But surprised? Shocked? Not really. The election was loud and clear, overtly fascistic, openly, objectively racist. A vote for Trump was a vote for white supremacy, for patriarchy, for misogyny, for violence. A vote for Trump was a vote for war and mass incarceration and mass surveillance, for borders and for poverty. In no uncertain terms, on November 8th, those in the US who could voted for black death, which is actually the same as saying that on November 8th, those in the US who could voted for business as usual. Trump's rise to power was not shocking to me because I understood that the current world order is white supremacist, it is capitalist, it is ableist and transphobic and homophobic and queerphobic, and it produces and reproduces anti-black racism. And that is not a system you can vote yourself out of. On November 8th, freedom was not on the ballot box. Which is also to say that a vote for Hillary was also a vote for black death. The simple fact is this, black people in every country in the world are in a state of war. In a reality where anti-black violence punctuates the daily experiences of black people, it permeates our bodies, permeates our minds, it characterizes our fear and our anger, but also our joy and our love. When anti-blackness disenfranchises us and chokes us, when it incites fear and murders us, when it poisons our water, when it contaminates our air, Trump's election comes not as a surprise, but as confirmation that the current world order sanctifies and rewards the very systems that kill us. In June of this year, the UK voted for business as usual as well. The Brexit campaign, like the Republican campaign, was a campaign fueled by anti-immigration rhetoric, held up by fascist tabloids and outright lies. A vote to leave the EU was a vote for a united kingdom that does not see black humanity. But let's be rigorous. To remain or to leave, 
Business as usual for the British state is the continuation of sustained colonial violence in every non-white community across the globe since the dawn of its existence. A week before the EU referendum, a white politician pushing for us to remain in the EU by the name of Joe Cox was murdered in broad daylight by a fascist on the street. Let me reiterate. Fascism has been coming for black people since dawn. Before Joe's children lost their mother, a Muslim grandfather was murdered by another fascist on the way home from the mosque. Before those children lost their mother in broad daylight, black mothers have been losing their babies in the street. The nation does not mourn those deaths. But we mourned for Joe. And I was disturbed by how it was reported in the news. The murder of Joe Cox was labeled as an attack on free speech as an attack on democracy. It was said that a well of hatred killed Joe, but listen, this well has been fed. This well is full. This well is draped in the British flag, screaming Britain first. This well is anti-immigration. This well is anti-black, Islamophobic, homophobic, transphobic, ableist. This well is sexist. This well was built by fascism and lies. We have to name these deaths for what they are, and that is legitimized. That is state-sanctioned. Right after the referendum, there was a 41% rise in reported hate crimes in Britain. And many people were shocked and saddened by this. They wanted to help. And many white people wore safety pins as a symbolic gesture on the outside of their clothing to show people of color that they need not be afraid of being attacked by them. It was a symbolic gesture, and symbols are important. Because what does the safety pin symbolize? The safety pin is a temporary fixture. But black people need more than temporary measures. We actually need transformative change to ensure our safety. We need white people to do more than to wear safety pins. We are fighting for our freedom and our vision is decolonial. We are fighting for our freedom, and our vision is abolitionist. We are fighting for our freedom, and our vision is radically inclusive because we intend to win together. Let me give you a scenario by a guy called Alan Johnson. A scene in which a gang of white men are beating a black woman in broad daylight on the city street. In this scenario, there are some onlookers present, and they are white. They feel no ill will towards the women being beaten, and they're also not cheering on the attackers. They're just minding their own business. And then one of the attackers looks over to the onlookers, looks them in the eyes and says, we appreciate your support. We could not do this without you. And with this scenario, Johnson makes the claim that this is how racism and other forms of privilege really work day in and day out. He says it results from a sort of passive oppression, which he defines as making it possible for oppression to happen simply by not doing anything to stop it. I see two main problems with this scenario, though. 
and I need you to remember them because they apply to you. The first is that I believe that all oppression is active. Our complicity in oppression is a choice that we make every single day. Because ultimately, the attackers in the Johnson scenario were not wrong when they said we could not do this without you. Minding your own business is not passive oppression, it's just oppression, and all oppression is a choice. The second is to do with the framing of the scenario. In this scenario, it is implied that the mob of white men who are being so violent will stop when the onlookers just do something. But that also doesn't reflect reality. And it sets us up for what has been called the savior complex. But I'm not asking to be saved. and neither was the Aboriginal elder, activist, and educator Leela Watson when she said that if you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come here because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. You see, the Johnson scenario is missing a fundamental element because the black woman who is being beaten is given no voice, no agency, no power. She is given no room to determine the outcome of her struggle. But I know that my voice and my power and my agency are actually fundamental tools to get me free, to get us free. Zora Neale Hurston said it, she warned us, she said, if you are silent about your pain, they'll kill you and say you enjoyed it. Black lives matter. Three words written by a queer black woman by the name of Alicia Garza, sanctified by her co-creators, Patrice Cullors and Opal Tomati whose organizing has mobilized us into a new movement moment, led by black women, led by black gay women, led by black queer people, led by our black trans family. To be clear as to why I'm standing here talking to you, I'm not asking to be saved. I'm not asking for help. History shows us very clearly and in various contexts that people of color cannot wait around for white empathy to transform into meaningful action. Our lives actually matter too much to wait for white people to see our humanity. What I am doing is trying to illuminate for you because I don't think people fully understand it. When black people get free, we all get free. Alliances can emerge when people who are not black recognize that business as usual is a vote for death in the same way that we have already realized that our death is intolerable. I want you to understand the extent to which this is unsustainable for all of us. Whether or not you have been forced to realize it yet. All lives will matter when black lives do. In this weighted political moment, our mandate goes unchanged. Organize against white supremacy and state-sanctioned violence until all black lives matter. Because our narratives are the product of multiple interlocking oppressions that manifest as a synthesized experience, one that we are best placed to explain. It is with the same kind of openness and fluidity and willingness to interrogate power that we as feminists expect from men in alliance, that women of color should expect from white women. And that our trans family 
must expect from people who are not trans. Our incarcerated family and undocumented family can also expect it from us who do not have to call prisons and detention centers our home. We must all hold as expectations of ourselves a commitment to be consistently attentive to all aspects of power that we ourselves do not experience so that we can all bring our full selves to the movement. Always begin by listening. But remember, too, that we have been organizing and speaking out about the condition of our lives in order to, to get free for a while now. It's time to transform your silence into action. So let's go back to the Johnson scenario, because the onlookers have a choice to make. And if you are white, I am directing this at you. You can continue to take refuge in the face of the death you have overwhelmingly voted for. You can make the choice to support the attacks on black, indigenous, Muslim, queer, trans, disabled, migrant, undocumented, poor people, on women, on non-binary folks, on those with mental illness. You can continue to sanctify whiteness, to cling to the illusion of ownership of the earth forever and ever. Or you can use your relative safety and the access to resources that white supremacy hands to you to enact something different. You can do the hard work of confronting your whiteness, your privilege, your complicity in oppression. You can begin to construct an identity that is not built on a foundation of supremacist violence. Divest in the systems that oppress us and invest in the work we are already doing to get free. Invest your time in getting free, like really, really free. All of us free. If you're white and you're wondering what to, to do, please leave your safety pins at home. Put everything you think you know on the back burner and commit yourself to revolution or burn yourself out, fighting for an oil painting on an oversized white canvas sealed with the flesh of your indecision. I'm going to call my mother and my grandmother and my cousins and my aunties and my uncles, and then I'm going to call my sister and my best friends and the women I love, I'm going to call the people who make me feel safe and share with them my deepest fears. And I'm going to call the people I organize with because there is a new world order coming and we'll need to make sure that all black lives matter when it gets here. Thank you.